Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single family homes all the way up to 600 plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Good afternoon, and welcome to the show. This is Andy Webb with Lifestyles Unlimited. And as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Hey, spring has sprung. We have officially moved from winter into spring a couple days ago on the 21st, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to death. I love the springtime. I'm in Texas. It gets pretty hot in the summer. I love the summer, too. Of course, spring has sprung, and I'm, I'm eyeballing those trees out there. Pollen is already starting to accumulate, and it's going to be dropping any time now. And then here come the allergies, and uh, we'll, we'll be ready for that. So I've got a few things on my mind today, in particular around the topic of home ownership. I'm not talking about rental homes. I'm talking about your personal your personal residence, your personal home. I want to talk a little bit about what's the trend right now. Is 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 ownership in the U.S. is it is it declining or is it increasing? Is it is it a good thing? to be a homeowner, to own your personal residence, or, or maybe maybe a bad thing, actually. We'll, we'll get into that, and we'll talk a little bit about the notion of asset versus liability. And I want to compare and contrast how we, as rental owners, operate our, our personal house compared to how we operate our portfolio of rental homes, rental houses. Uh, they're a little bit different. There's some, there's some uh, places where they, where they meet, they touch. Uh, we operate in a similar way, but there's some pretty big differences you want to understand. And I'll tell you a quick note. We talked about this a show or two ago. The IRS, I mentioned at, at the time, had extended the tax filing deadline for us here in Texas and our neighbors to the north in Oklahoma due to the, the winter weather, the winter disaster that was extended for us in these two states until June 15th. So pushed back two years. And at the time we were postulating, well, lots of folks are asking, can we please move it back for the rest of us as well? And guess what? Lo and behold, they have done that very thing now. Not quite as far back. If you're outside of Oklahoma, if you are outside of Texas, they have now postponed that tax filing deadline until May 17th. So you have a little bit more breathing room if uh, if you've been dragging your feet. Okay, so and something you don't want to drag your feet on is refinancing or buying if you plan to finance. Because guess what? Interest rates, man, they went down, 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 and now they're starting to creep back up. And I bring that up in part because I am in the process as it seems like I always am, of doing a cash out refinance. But now this time it's on my personal residence, which is why I have home ownership on my mind. Now, if you've got something on your mind, you want to ask a question around real estate, today's topic or anything else, uh, give me a call. It's 855-497-4335. Again, 855-497-4335. Or send me an email to askandy at L-U-I-N-C. Dot com And it's an interesting spring for me. I've got a big live oak in the back of my, my yard, and normally it's got all that pollen dangling from it right now that I have to clean out of the gutter pretty regularly. It's edging along. I think it's coming back to life. It got pretty hammered, as all the live oaks around Texas did up here in the north anyhow, uh, as part of the, the deep freeze. And if, if, you, if you don't know what that is, a live oak is a tree that normally keeps its leaves throughout the year. It's, it's hence its name, alive. It's, it's continuing to, to flower in, in essence. And Normally, you know, it's got a little bit of droppage here and there, kind of like a dog shedding, you know, a little bit, but they're starting to drop their leaves totally. Uh, I guess as, as part of the deep freeze, they've been a bit damaged. Um, we're expecting all the leaves to drop. I've been cleaning my gutters every two days. <laughs> That's one of my jobs as a homeowner. And uh, we're waiting to see if it buds. It looks like it's going to pull through. Let's hope it does. But again, as a homeowner, there are things I have to do around my house. And, and one of those is cleaning the gutters, taking care of the yard, uh, paying my property taxes, paying my insurance, things like that. Now, if you're a rental property owner, maybe you do some or all of those things as well. We'll, we'll talk about that. But to start with, the American dream, right? That is home ownership. That is part of it, right? If you think back to the old old clips in the 50s, right? You got the the, the house with the, back then, a one-car garage. You got the car. Uh, you got the two and a half kids, white picket fence, all that good stuff. Is that still the American dream or is home ownership still part of that? And some economists at the, the Federal Reserve branch in Philadelphia, they, they asked that very question 
and put out a good paper called The American Dream or American Obsession. And they looked at the economic benefits and costs of home ownership. We're going to dive into that uh, just a little bit here, probably after the, the break here in a couple minutes. But they asked some good questions. Now, this study is from late 2010. So this followed the, the, the bust that we saw as part of the, the buildup in housing, home ownership actually back in, in 2006. And, and it's interesting. So to get to that question, is home ownership increasing or decreasing in the U.S.? Well, if, if you go back to the you know pre-World War II, home ownership at the time was about 40%. And it built up, and it built up, and we were close to 70% just ahead of the the housing bust. And that was the peak. That was the peak. I don't think it quite hit 70%. I think it looks like 69 point something, fill in the blank there, 69.2, hard to read on the graph. I'm, I'm looking at this is also from the Federal Reserve, the St. Louis branch, but it peaked and then obviously crashed tremendously down to 62%. And it is climbing again. It has been climbing. Now it's becoming more difficult to become a homeowner here in Texas. If you think about it, days on market in places like Austin, there are parts of Austin where houses listed for sale are on the market fewer, you know, less, less than a week. The day's inventory, which tells you how long until everything sells out in some sub markets within Austin is seven days seven days here in the dallas fort worth area we're a little bit uh, north of one month houston's right at about two months san antonio right at about one month very very tight in spite of that people are still out there trying to buy they're they're making offers above a list doing everything they can to take down that home but but it begs the question is home ownership really the way to go and we'll get into that economist paper i looked across the sea since i spent a lot of time living overseas in, in germany in particular never got the feeling that home ownership was so favored there germany by the way 51 percent, so it's quite a bit lower than us across europe they're the second lowest though there are markets over there romania gets up to 95 percent home ownership in part because it's subsidized and some of what our government do, does here is subsidize home ownership and we'll ask the question in the next segment is that the right thing to do so stay tuned Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. It's time to turn up the volume and fine-tune your passive income plan so you can create the lifestyle you've always wanted. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb, and today on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, we're taking a look at home ownership in the U.S., in the United States, and does it make sense for everybody? Home ownership for all. Our, our government certainly does what they can to promote that. Subsidies in some cases. And I was looking just ahead of the break with you at some European countries. By contrast, I lived in Germany for quite a long time. I rented when I was there, of course. And the home ownership rate there is, is actually quite low, 51%. I always had that feeling, but I never knew exactly what it was at. What surprises me is the level of home ownership in most of the other markets is very, very high as high as 95% in, in Romania, which I suspect that has to do with the fact it's a little bit more agrarian there. But it's, it's interesting as well. You know, our, our government does what they can, like like we said, to help promote own, home ownership. And, and the study I looked at here from the uh, Philadelphia Federal Reserve questions whether that's a wise thing to do. And we're, we're going to get into that here in, in just a moment. And, and there's a number of things that, that you're familiar with that the government does to encourage you to take ownership of of a home and the authors you know they they question what are the true economic benefits and costs of home ownership what is the return on this quote unquote investment that you're really getting and they, and they question a few precepts we're going to take a look at that and then later in the show i want you if you are a homeowner i want you to do what i'm doing now or start thinking about doing what i'm doing now which is a cash out refinance we'll talk about what you need to think about in preparing for that what we're doing right now in fact and uh, possibly even selling maybe that maybe that's a good option like i said in, ahead of the break as well the market the, the days on market very very short there's very little inventory so if you are going to divest an asset a single family house, apartments, your personal residence, it's, it's a very good time to do that. If you're trying to buy a personal residence, it's very, very competitive. Now, if you're buying like we do in terms of our rental houses, different story, different story. We're out there, we're moving, we're shaking, we're taking down deals. So it's a little bit different when we get into that space, but 
to begin with. American dream or American obsession. Again, 40% home ownership before World War II peaked at about 70% ahead of the uh, the housing crisis a uh, decade plus ago, cratered, so to speak, down to 62.9% in, in about mid-2016, climbed back up to 67% in about middle of 2020. It's dropped a little bit, and we're now sitting at, as of Q4 2020 at 65%. 0.8%. And the authors of the study, Wen Li Li and, and Fang Yang, they're, they're up in the Northeast <clears throat> around Philadelphia. They, they addressed a couple of important questions and a few of the reasons why people tend to buy a house. Some people say, you know what? I need a way to save. I'm not good at saving. I'm going to buy a house so that every month I pay the mortgage and I build my equity. <laughs> it, is a, it is truly a means for them of saving, a rather illiquid way, I would say. That's one reason why people buy, and the other is as a means of investment. They, they, they view this thing, this house, it's, their, it's your biggest investment. You hear that all the time. It's your largest investment. Is it an investment? And if you view it that way, is it a good one? We'll, we'll get to that. First and foremost, that notion of a home as a means of forced savings. Here's the problem <laughs> with us as Americans. We are a consumer society. Sure, we pay down that mortgage, we pay down that mortgage, we pay down that mortgage on our personal house, and, and eventually we get that equity. And rates are low. Hey, let's go do what Andy's talking about. Let's do a cash out refinance. We go do it. We do it. We get that cash out. 20K, 30K, 50K, 100K. Depends on your, your asset, your equity. And you go and blow it on a vacation, a new car, consumer goods. Maybe you pay down a little credit card debt. That's, that's a great idea. But, but, but for the most part, According to the authors of this study, folks that they get into that house as a means of saving do not save. They view it as an ATM automa automatic teller machine, and they, they go to the ATM as often as they can, and it's getting easier and easier to do that. It's getting easier again. Things tightened up after the housing crash. They're loosening again, and people are taking advantage of that. You can too if you do it for the right reason, but a lot of people don't. So that, that notion of saving is not working. Now, I don't want to discourage you from buying your own personal residence. There are certainly reasons to do so. The other reason that, that, that is often cited is that it is an investment. It, it is not an investment. And if you view it that way, again, the authors of the study, I'm not going to go into their math. These are two economists, two of them, not just one, but two. <laughs> so reading through the 10 pages of this article, my head was spinning a little bit here and there. But the nuts and bolts of their analysis is they got down to a number, which is that the rate of return for most folks on their personal residence. You want to know what it is? It's not zero. It's slightly negative. You're actually making a slight loss in most cases, according to their numbers. Again, this was published back in uh, Q3 of 2010, shortly after the housing crisis. They were, they were looking, taking a look at, is it worth subsidizing housing for people like we do? Does everybody really need to be in a home? Well, that was part of the problem back in 2006 to 2008 when things crashed. Are we seeing that again? I don't know. It's a little bit frothy. I think the I think the fundamentals are a little bit stronger this time. Lack of inventory being being the biggest one here, driving up prices. So I, I think we'll have a different outcome. But stay tuned. We'll see, right? But those are the two biggest reasons why people tend to buy a personal house, or, or often cited reasons, which are number one, I, I I'm a bad saver. This will compel me to save. Doesn't work. And it's my it's an investment, not an investment. And we'll get into a little bit more reasoning behind that as well that you may have heard before. Now, there are good reasons to buy a home. There are what they call, so this study, it's their economists. They're looking at the economic side of things, but they do note that, yes, there are social benefits. They call it social benefits of home ownership. You, you, you tend to get a little more civically involved. You know, maybe you don't run for mayor, but maybe you go to the, the city meetings from time to time. You as a homeowner, I've been in houses where I would disagree with the statement, but overall, overall you, you tend to maintain your properties a little bit better. Maybe be better renters in, in, in the words of the, excuse me, better neighbors than renters in the words of the uh, study writers here. And you tend to socialize more with your neighbors. You're, you're more of a community. And, and there's certainly, and we've seen that with COVID-19. We've had, we've, we've lost that community and it's affecting a lot of people extremely negatively. But well, when you own a home, you tend to be a little more involved with your neighbors. Not everybody. I get it. When, you know, there's folks that are a little reclusive, but um, for the most part, you get to know your neighbors. You lean on them. Hey, can you get my mail while I'm, while I'm out, you know, the, traveling the next week? Or, hey, can you water my plane? You know, stuff like that. Our neighbors were out when the, when the deep freeze hit. We, we checked on their house. We, we, we tightened things up for them. Make, made sure nothing went wrong. That's what you get with home ownership the social benefits, but saving as a means of saving, it's not there. And as an investment, 
Well, let's talk about that a little bit more in detail. Now, they isolated a negative return for home ownership. Let's think about it from a, from a different point of view. Is your, and you probably heard this before, is your personal home an asset or a liability? You've heard already people view it as an investment, therefore an asset. If you've ever heard of Robert Kiyosaki, he wrote a great book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That book alone has introduced, I don't know how many millions of people to real estate investing. If you haven't read it, give it a read. He defines there, and we're going to define after the break, an asset and a liability. And we're going to apply that to our houses. And I think there's an exception to your house when it actually can be an asset. We'll talk about when that is and how you can leverage that. So stay tuned. You're listening to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. We will be right back. with the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. We're here to answer your questions and help you become financially free. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb, and we're talking today about a classic topic, home ownership, the American dream. Everybody needs to have a house. Everybody needs to own a house. My wife and I have this conversation quite often. Is that really the case? Our feeling is no. And we looked at a study in the last segment from two authors with the uh, Philadelphia branch of the Federal Reserve. This was published back in 2010 after the the last after the housing crisis. And they they found that no, at least from an economic standpoint, the precepts that we have, that it helps us save, that it is an investment, a good investment. They're simply not true. Okay, it doesn't help us save because what do we do? We go to the bank as soon as we see any equity in there. We're going to talk about a cash out refi here in just a minute. There's a time when I think that's a good thing to do. And then they also say, well, investment, the return that they calculated, these are two economists putting their heads together, negative, not just slightly positive, not zero, but a negative return for most people. Why? Well, think about it. What just happened here in Texas? (laughs) Snowmageddon, a winter disaster as declared by President Biden. And it was. It was rough for a lot, a lot of people. It was rough here. We didn't have any damage at our house. Now we've got damage with our big live oak in the backyard, I suppose. We'll, we'll see. But there are costs associated with that. And we'll talk about that. Now, that ties into what I was leading into at the end of the last segment. Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And in there, he defines assets and liabilities. Simple definition of an asset, something that puts money into your pocket. That's an asset. A liability by contrast, or by comparison, it's simple definition again, something that takes money out of your pocket. Now you think about your house that you're living in right now. What did it do in middle of February? It took a lot of money out of your pocket if you had any kind of pipe breaks, any other damage. In a good year, it does that. Property taxes, insurance, general maintenance, HOA if, you're, if, you, if you live in a, in a community that, has, uh, that is part of an HOA, and so on and, and so forth. That is a definition. That is the definition of a liability. You're just constantly giving out money for this house, for this home, your personal house. Now, we're not talking about rental houses. We'll get there. We're talking about your personal house. It is not an asset in that sense. It is not an investment. It's great to have a roof over your head. It's great to be part of a community. Those social benefits are very, very strong and I think very much worthwhile. Now, I have a lot of friends that are real estate investors that do not own their personal house. One of the costs of home ownership is you cast an anchor. You throw out the anchor. It's called reduced mobility. It's, well, in in this market, maybe maybe that's less true. (laughs) We have such a a dearth of inventory. You could probably get up and get that thing sold within a week. But in normal circumstances, it it does slow down your mobility. Uh, Transaction costs can be a little bit high as well. So a lot of my friends live in apartments, condos, maybe they even rent a house. I got, a, I got buddies that just sold their personal residence, and they're doing like we're doing. They're in an RV, just kind of cruising around. So they've got true mobility. But the point is that thing that you think is an asset is not putting any money into your pocket. It is simply taking it away. And it gets worse. There's something called dead equity. As you pay down that mortgage, that, that quote-unquote saving that you're doing, if you're not that person that treats your house as an ATM and takes the cash out to go get more consumer goods, good for you, but now you're just sitting on that equity. And what return is it giving you? Zero to negative. Let's say you, let's just say you have a little north of $100,000 in equity that you could cash out. Do a cash out refinance. Rates are great right now. And what if you could then take that 100 k that you cash out 
and invest it in something that's generating an actual return, let's say 10% per annum, you'll be making $10,000 a year now off of your house, off of that appreciation, off of that equity that you levered out of the house. You've taken that debt equity and you've put it to work for you. So for the most part, your personal house does not bring you any income. You know, maybe you do Airbnb from time to time, something like that. But hey, that's peanuts. That's peanuts. If you're just running it on the side, the place where your house can truly become an asset, at least for a brief period of time, is if you do what we're talking about today, which is that cash out refinance, bring that money out of it to deploy elsewhere, or maybe you just outright sell it. But if you've got a, enough equity in there, maybe it's worth just taking that off the table altogether. You're older. The kids are out of the house like our friends that just sold theirs. You could downsize, maybe not all the way down to that 200 square foot RV, but you downsize into something smaller and you've got a lot of equity left over to deploy, to work for you. So your family, your situation has changed in some way. This is a very, very good time to sell. Sell now, go rent for a period of time and deploy that cash somewhere that's making you money rather than taking it away. Now, I wanna move on a little bit and I wanna talk about how Owning and operating your own home compares and, and, and more importantly differs from owning and operating a rental home. We're talking about two houses. Maybe these two houses are on the same street. Have you ever heard the phrase, cobbler's children have no shoes? That described my wife and I for the better part of almost a decade. We bought this house middle of the year 2012. Bought two rental properties a little short time after that that same year and have continued to do so year after year. What do we do? We went into those rental properties, vacant properties, dressed them up, fixed the foundation, put in new HVAC, new air conditioners, fixed everything else that needed fixing and, and gave it a cosmetic facelift. Made those things beautiful. Best product on the market. We had them leased in no time. Cash coming in the door month after month. <laughs> what did we do with our house? Nothing. Those floors, those, those old laminate floors that my wife said she hated when we bought it, loved everything else. She's like, we got to do something about the floors. Nine years later. Nine years later, we're finally doing it, in part because we want to cash out that equity. We'll talk about, again, what you need to do if you want to do a cash out refinance. We'll get to that in the last segment. The point is this. You own the house. You get comfortable with it. You stop noticing the flaws, that, that cracked sheetrock, the slight decline in the foundation in that back corner of the house, those laminate floors that you, didn't, that you planned to replace when you bought it. As a homeowner, you don't always take your time to fix things. And when you do, you really take your time. You do it yourself, and it takes a very long time. Maybe maybe it's halfway done. Compare that to our rental properties. What do we do? We are in and we are out, in part because we buy distressed assets that really do need a lot of work. We buy those with hard money, which is a high-interest loan, so I have every incentive to get into that thing and get back out as fast as I can. Think of it as a construction loan, 12%, 14% per annum. But we're in and out in a couple of months, and we, we refinance out of that hard money loan into a 30-year term mortgage. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those subsidized mortgages that our government likes to use to encourage home ownership. So being a, you know, being a rental owner, we do things differently. We do things differently. So if you're a homeowner sitting on the side thinking about getting into the game, but then realizing, boy, it takes me so long just to change a light bulb and do these sundry other little things, that is not how you operate. That is simply not how you operate. So what are some other similarities? Well, again, when we go in and fix up that to become rental house, right? We just picked it up off the market. It's vacant. And because it's vacant, our guys get in and out a heck of a lot faster. They're not having to move furniture. They're not worried about dinging things up because they're fixing it in the first place. And it's a lot less expensive. As I come to you live right now, there are guys in my living room fixing stuff up around the chimney, doing some stuff with the floors so that we can get through the process of our cash out refinance. They're going to charge me a little more because we got stuff all over. We're bumping into each other. We're all wearing masks, COVID-19. When's a vacant house? Totally different animal costs a lot, lot less. That's one reason why we as investors can get our properties fixed up and still have a big equity buffer on the back end. Plus, as you build your portfolio, you're doing more and more volume and your vendors, they love that. And even if it's your very first house, when you use the Lifestyles Unlimited vendors, we have those on our vendor hub if you're a member, you're getting essentially volume to them, bigger volume to them, even though it's your first house through our broader membership base. We're sending them so much business, we're getting good, good deals. Now, when we come back from the break, I want to finish this conversation. I want to tell you what you need to do to prepare to do that cash out refinance or maybe even sell your property. So stay tuned.
Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Now, let's get back to your map to financial freedom. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Andy Webb, and today we're talking about home ownership. And I mentioned earlier in the show that our government here in the United States, it does what it can to help promote home ownership. Now, that's not always the best thing in my mind. And there's a study by economists that, that really supports that. A lot of our notions going into a house, the reasons why we might buy one to, to live in personally, they're just not supported. Not a good investment and really not a good way to force myself to save. <laughs> you know, there are other ways to do that. But the government does try to promote home ownership. And some of the policies, I just want to throw these out there. And I've mentioned a couple of these during the show today, but uh, first and foremost, the, the inexpensive, the very cheap financing that you can get. You probably heard us talk on shows about Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. That is the cheapest stuff you can get, especially for real estate investors. And these these agencies, they essentially get to borrow at preferential rates because their mortgages are then backed by the government. They're government-sponsored entities. And aside from that, you know, you think of the FHA, that's typically that's not anything I can use as a, as an investor, but that's for for true home ownership. They have loans out there where you can get in for three percent, three and a half percent, very little down, and they'll cover your closing costs and other costs affiliated with the transaction. Which is where I am left scratching my head. Is that a good idea? Because then what happens when you have that cold snap when snowmageddon comes around the corner all of a sudden? Are you going to be able to afford the pipe break repair and everything else that goes along with that? Your home ownership, or excuse me, your home insurance should cover that. But point is that there are a lot of expenses that go along, along with that home ownership that maybe people are just not aware of. So government does what they can. Aside from that, you can deduct your mortgage interest and you can deduct your property taxes. Now, there's a cap put into place by the uh, Trump administration. So our friends on the coast where those taxes tend to be higher don't enjoy the, the benefits there quite so much. And effectively, what are you doing as a homeowner? You're paying your mortgage every month. You're effectively paying yourself rent <laughs> and you're not taxed on that rent. But we as real estate investors, savvy real estate investors, guess what? Our cash flow has little to no taxes on it as well. Let's talk about a few other ways where we as homeowners, personal homeowners, behave a little bit differently or manage our, our home a little bit differently than, say, we as real estate investors that own single family houses. Right, we already talked about uh, getting the work done, the renovations, and just ongoing maintenance. Let something comes up, we, we have that done. Those repairs, we can also expense as part of our business. I cannot do that for part of my house. I mentioned in the last segment, we've, I've got guys in my living room right now fixing up the house so that we can go through and do a cash out refinance. I cannot expense that. It's not a business. My rental properties are. So those repairs that we do at the outset when we buy the property, the CapEx, everything that goes along with that, we expense that or capitalize it and depreciate it over time. The mortgage interest, same with my personal house, we expense that. What about property taxes? What about insurance? Those are expensed as well. And even better, rents are going up. What do we do? When there's a turnover and I have a new resident moving in or just at renewal time, if my insurance goes up and you can bet your insurance is going to go up anywhere in Texas next year as a result of the winter weather disaster. So be prepared for that. But if your insurance goes up and you have a rental property, you're going to pass that through in the rent. Property tax increase values are up. They're going to, your property tax valuation will go up as will your taxes. Expense that and it's also going to be a pass through. So net effect on your cash flow should be close to zero. On top of that, I can depreciate that property. And that's why I don't pay taxes on that cash flow either. I take that house. I've done my repairs. Forget about the land value, the sticks and bricks plus repairs. I depreciate that over the course of 27 and a half years. That is a phantom expense that is on my tax filing at year end that offsets my cash flow, brings me to zero so that I don't pay taxes on that. Big, big benefit that you do not have on your personal property. Obviously, cash flow. We already talked about asset versus liability. My house is not putting money in my pocket every month like my rental properties are. We do not do the deal if it does not cash flow. Here in Texas, we're seeing anywhere from 300 up to 600, even more. I've seen deals recently come across my desk that are even higher. We buy those deals at cash flow because we want that asset putting money in our pockets every month. And as our residents pay down the mortgage for us, well, we get that equity build up. And when we get that equity built up and built up again and again and again, and we get that dead equity in there, we look at our return on equity, we realize, well, ooh, it's getting a little thin. Then we do that cash out refinance or we sell. 
We also buy right. I talked about this already. It's a distressed asset that needs a lot of work. And because of that, we're getting it at a discount. We are not right now. MLS getting deals on, on the market's a little tight. A lot of what we get is off market though. Distressed sellers. I was in a grocery store just this weekend. I have a shirt that says we buy houses on the back has my telephone number. This lady approaches me. She's got a mask on. I've got a mask on. I'm not quite understanding her. She says, is it true? I say, huh? Is it true? What? What your shirt says, you buy houses, it is absolutely true. Can I have your card? Here you go. Are you looking to sell? Not right now, but probably very soon. Off-market deal. That's where we go to get our deals. And we buy right. Assets that are distressed, sellers that are distressed, and we capture equity at the outset. That's a buffer, by the way, that when we see, if we see a housing collapse again, it protects us. We plan to own that asset because it puts cash in our pocket every month. So we just own it right on through that dip and right on back uh, upside of that hill again. And then maybe it's time to sell or cash out. That's that appreciation. So on that note, let's talk about that cash out refinance. So I've been in my house close to a decade living with those same <laughs> miserable floors. My dog has passed away. He's done his damage. So we said, you know what? Now's the time. Let's do it. Market's up. Values are up, rates are down. Let's get that cash out and get that into a deal or two or three houses, passive apartment deals, maybe even an independent rental owner deal. All right, but we got to get the cash out first. So if you're thinking about all that equity you got sitting on your house right now, first and foremost, look at your house. What does it need? What do you, what's your scope of work? If you were to get it dressed up for sale right now, what would you need to do? For us, it was the floors. We did the foundation a couple of years ago. Roof got put on after a hailstorm a couple of years ago. A little bit of cosmetic stuff here and there on the tail end of that. Already in communication with our lender. So you'll need to start that conversation with your mortgage broker or your lender. See what rates are. See what you're qualified for. Is your debt to income where it needs to be in order to qualify to do that cash out refinance? And then start talking with, if you have a realtor friend, because you're going to want to look at the comp. So comp is a comparable sale for your neighborhood, for your subdivision, because you need to know how do I need to dress up my house to get that value that those three houses over there got when they sold. What do I need to do? Is it granite countertops or am I okay keeping the Formica? Paint color doesn't matter. You know, if it's not crazy garish colors, I suppose you're fine. New floors in our case. What else might you need to do? So you want to talk with somebody if you don't have access yourself to get to sold comps or sales comps, comparable houses that have sold, because that's what an appraiser is going to do. When your lender gets to that point, you're, you're pre-qualified, you're looking good, they're ready to pull the trigger, they're going to send out that appraiser, and they're going to look at your house, they're going to look at the work you did, you're going to give them that scope of work, say, hey, look at these things I fixed up, and they're going to find similar properties. Okay, yeah, that puts the value, let's say, at 300000 Boom. Now it's your personal house. We're talking about personal house here. We've done cash out refis on our single family rental homes as well. On those, you can get a new loan up to 75%. So that's your cap, loan to value. On your personal house, 80%. So you can go a little bit higher, pull a little bit more out. So you're going to get that value sent back from that appraiser. Now you know. Just get into the closing table. But you need to do a little bit of prep work first. Same thing if you're going to sell. Well, let's come back to that, actually. For the cash out refi, you know, you're going to do your repairs, but do not over improve. Whatever you do, there's actually an article came across my desk this week uh, it's from Texas Realtor Magazine. It says some improvements add marketability, not value. And an appraiser is quoted here. He says, I've seen people put in a you know $50,000 outdoor living area in a $200,000 neighborhood and expect to get that back. And it's just not there. It's an over improvement. And we as homeowners tend to over improve our property, I think, when we get going with this sort of stuff. So you need to be careful, pull the reins back a little bit, and use some discretion there. That's for the refi. We want it to look good. We want it to shine so we can get out as much as we can. You're going to figure out how to dress that up based on those sold comps. By the way, if you are a member at Lifestyles Unlimited, we have a great product called Quest, which allows you to go in to the MLS effectively and see what has sold, what those comparables are. You see the pictures so you know how to model your product, your house. And if you're doing this for your own rental house, you can look at the lease comparables as well to figure out, well, renewal time's coming up. What should I rent that house for? That's really it. If you are thinking about selling, days on market, very, very, very short. Tight inventory, minimal repairs. You don't need to dress it to the nines. You get that on the market, it's going to go. We're seeing a lot of prices or, or offers coming in above market, above list rather. We're having issues with appraisals because they're coming in so high. 30 offers, 40, 50. I saw a deal recently in Plano here in North Dallas. 90 offers. 
They're going fast. So for your cash out refi, dress it up right. You're going to be living there. Enjoy it for that sale. Hey, keep it minimal, but get that cash out. Get that debt equity out of that liability so you can put it into a true asset. Hey, you can learn more about Lifestyles Unlimited if you go check us out at freeworkshoplivestream.com. We'll talk about the five ways we make money, six in apartments, talk about the general model. Freeworkshoplivestream.com. And remember, it's not the money, it's the lifestyle. You have a good day. The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.